Uh, hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Unit 8 team. You're joining Unit 8 Talks, our webinar series on, on data and AI. Uh, I'm Kamil Zalewski, uh, the AI practice lead of, uh, of Unit 8. Uh, together with me, we have uh, Fabian Schramm, who runs our insurance practice. And the topic of today's webinar is from customer churn to climate change, the impact of AI in the insurance industry. Uh, feel free to use the chat window uh, for any types of questions. I will be looking forward to a, to a good discussion. Uh, Fabian, over to you to, to kick us off. Awesome. Thanks, Camille. Hello, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, thanks for joining. As Camille said, today we're going to be discussing the impact of AI, so artificial intelligence, within the insurance industry. Um, we've broken it down into three sections. So. Um, bit of an overview as to what artificial intelligence is, why is it happening now, what we understand of it, um, some yeah, real life use cases of artificial intelligence being used in insurance, and uh, then our experience um, as Unit 8 being a data science and analytics services company here in Switzerland, what do we know of these types of projects and um, how can you approach them? So, Artificial intelligence, um, it's this buzzword that's being used more and more nowadays, but what does it really mean? Um, natural language processing, so having computers understand voice, having understanding human interaction, that's a part of it. Translating speech into text, translating text into speech, translating different languages, another part. The whole vision topic, recognizing images, recognizing whether something is a cat or a dog, whether something is uh, an insurance claim, detecting what is the name, what is the age, what is the details of that. All of these systems, they go back into this machine learning topic, which uh, leads also into predictive analytics and um, is being used as algorithms based on machine learning, based on deep learning that fall into all of these sections. So that should generally give you an overview as to the different applications that we're seeing artificial intelligence being used in. And um, we're gonna go through some of those use cases more specifically within the insurance space. Why didn't we do this 20 years ago? So um, what's changed in the past, yeah, I mean, realistically 50, 60 years from when some of those first models were being developed till now. And the big thing is the computational power, so the processing power to analyze data and to run these more advanced models. And as well, the amount of data that's being generated by all of the different data sources that are available to us today, and then being able to store that data. And both of these components have been driven heavily in the past 10 years by the adoption of cloud technologies. So the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsoft Azures of the world, they are building up these cloud platforms, making it much easier to analyze and to store these data sets. And then I mentioned it, the algorithms, these models, it's, it's not that they're just being developed today, it's actually a renaissance of some of the models that initially were being developed in, in the 1960s. Uh, you had some of the first computer vision models in the early 90s, which were able to detect, to read text, which is being used for um, post-mail classification. And all of that is just coming together now and over the past couple of years with more advanced deep learning neural network models to enable some of the possibilities that we're seeing today. And you see it all around you. Um, when you pick up your phone and you say, hey Siri, what's the weather gonna be like? Again, natural language processing, understanding you, speaking back to you, that conversational AI, Uber, being able to understand demand patterns of how many drivers do we need on the road? How do we adjust the pricing based on those demands? Um, mobile banking and all the applications on your phone nowadays using AI to detect fraud, to detect um, mo movement, to detect all of these things. Um, Tesla, a prime example of all the Tesla cars you see on the road today, they are learning. 
they are understanding what are the obstacles that people face when driving. What does that sign that says stop, that is red mean? It means the car needs to stop. What are the different environments that um, a car can be in? And all of that data is being ingested by all the different sensors built into the car today and being brought back to learn and to build up these eventually self-driving car models. You've got tools like Nest, which is a smart thermometer that connects to the heating and cooling systems in buildings in your homes, but as well as the internet to detect weather patterns. So based on outdoor weather, the home knows, okay, I don't need to spend energy on cooling or heating. Mother Nature will do its job at cutting costs again there and saving energy. And then um, a big one now in pandemic times, um, Netflix, just the usage of that exploding over the past 12 months. But Netflix, when you log in, it tells you there's a 98% likelihood that you will like this TV show based on the past three or four other TV shows that you've watched. And that's again, aggregating millions of users and what they're watching and giving you that predictive feel of this is what fits for you. Now, for all of the examples that I just listed, data is at the heart of those, those companies and those business models. And uh, if we look at the insurance industry, there's lots of data to be had. There's all of the historic data, which might still be in paper form, it might be digitized, but all of the claims data, all of the insurance applications, all of the underwriting policies, all of that data is there. You've got a lot of data in ERP systems like SAP, like Oracle, all of those data sources. You've got CRM systems like Salesforce, collecting lots of user data, those interaction points between sales and marketing teams and their customers, mapping that customer journey. All of the medical records, this is always in the health insurance area, but this can be in the auto insurance area with claim submissions, car accident pictures, um, x-rays of broken arms, all of those data points being ingested. And then the big one that's becoming more and more prevalent is um, what we call IoT, so Internet of Things. Again, those connected smart devices, whether it's smart cars like Tesla with all the sensors built in, whether it's smart watches that can measure blood pressure, that can measure heart rate, that can measure activity levels, smartphones measuring location data, or drones taking in picture and uh, yeah, property data. And then going even one step further, geospatial data in the sense of satellite data, which we're seeing being used a lot in the property and casualty space. And all of these data sources are becoming more and more relevant and it's important for the different insurance teams to understand that the data in maybe that Salesforce, that CRM system, isn't just relevant for the sales and marketing teams. That can potentially help combining that with some sensor data, with some geospatial data, with the SAP data out of the ERP to help the underwriters make better underwriting more risk averse policies. So if we look at the indus uh, insurance industry, there's a couple of key challenges or opportunities. You can decide how you wanna look at them, but customers are demanding um, new offerings. So on a product development side, they're demanding things like on-demand insurance. They're demanding things like usage-based insurance. Um, in a lot of developing countries, we're seeing micro-insurance becoming a really popular air topic. From a sales and marketing point of view, that personalized offering, seeing exactly what's relevant for me, what's the next best offering based on the previous purchases or the existing contracts that the customer has, predicting customer churn, and overall increasing that customer loyalty and satisfaction um, are going to be key um, within the sales and marketing piece. Then, if we look at claims, that whole claims process, how do we improve overall the customer experience while improving the internal operations of the insurer and as well detecting fraud, fraudulent claim detection in that space being a really important topic and one where AI or data science or analytics fits really nicely. And then last but not least, I mean, 
the heart of the insurance industry in its origins already having been based on statistics, we're now moving away from that more yeah, modular and chart-driven risk or rule-based policies to this more modular and dynamic approach, better understanding risk, better segmenting customers, not in batches of, this is 10,000 um, 10, customers between the ages of 25 and 45, but this is, this is Fabian Schramm. He is, fits exactly this profile. So really going into a very granular approach when, when looking at customers and underwriting policies for them. And yeah, we're gonna look into each of these examples a bit more closely now. So sales and marketing. Customers are expecting um, that customer-specific product, that customer-specific recommendation. They don't want, um, if I'm 25, a uh, life insurance policy probably isn't what I'm looking for, but hopefully after COVID, maybe travel insurance is something that I'm interested in. So understanding what is relevant for me and making sure that the right customer receives the right message at the right time is really key. And you're gonna see technologies like prediction engines, like recommender systems coming into play here. Hyper-personalized content. When, um, if I use uh, Insurer's mobile app, is my visual experience different from someone else's? Is the messaging that I'm receiving targeted towards me. So technologies like natural language generation can recommender systems coming into play here to really personalize that content for each individual based on their habits and lifestyles and data points. And then uh, customer attention. So how do we keep customers? What, what types of machine learning models and natural language processing to determine sentiment analytics? How are they interacting with our agents or with our chatbots? And what can we learn out of that? And we're gonna deep dive into two of these um, a bit closer. So how do you recommend the most relevant products and services? So we said clients are expecting these, these highly customized interactions. There's cost pressures on the insurers to, yeah, to make every touch point and every recommendation as relevant and as likely to move to that buying stage. And obviously the, the portfolio of what's being offered is growing more and more because you're getting those more and more personalized offerings. So the same way that we mentioned earlier where Amazon is recommending you based on your buying history, this Netflix based on your watching history or Spotify based on your listening history, insurers can take the data out of those CRM systems, potentially out of smartwatch or health, fitness systems, whatever it might be, aggregating all of those different data sources to make the most intelligent recommendations to their customers, to recommend the most relevant products for them based on not, uh, uh, we haven't spoken to this customer in a long time, we're gonna reach out to him with, with another offering, but let's reach out to him with the right offering at the right time. And this is really important for insurers because there was actually a study done just constantly reaching out to customers, it's not the right approach. And it sometimes actually leads to extra customer churn because it gets customers thinking about potentially leaving their current insurer and moving to another one because they hadn't thought about it. So making sure that that messaging really resonates with them is key. And then in regards to identifying customer churn, which is a big topic and it costs insurers five to 25 times more to acquire new customers than it does to retain existing customers. So it's really important, any of a five or yeah, five percentage reduction in churn over five years has enormous impact on bottom line because any growth is, yeah, it's completely adding on and not being negated by that customer churn. So especially in the Swiss, in Switzerland with the health insurance market, Customers are being yeah, proactively called um, in the fall every year, being reminded, hey, are you, do you want to switch? Do you want to switch? And price is definitely a big um, point in switching, but 
the reason most customers leave is actually due to customer experience. So again, some of the tools that can go into there to improve that customer experience. And most insurers have the customer data. They have the data sets on their customers. They have the history of which customers left and what led up to that leaving. It's a lot of times just analyzing that data and developing these early warning systems, which flag customers saying, hey, these are the, these customers have a 95% likelihood of leaving and individually risk scoring those customers based on the hundreds of data points that you have on them through all of those different systems and then making these, um, yeah, these risk scores. So again, your sales and marketing teams work in a targeted approach to really identify and target the right customers with that right message to obviously retain those at-risk clients and at the same time increase their customer satisfaction. Claims. Um, it's one of the, yeah, I mean, aside from signing up for insurance, that claims interaction is one of the most important interaction points for a customer in regards to evaluating their insurer. So the experience that they have during this claims process is key. So automating that claims process to make that as customer friendly as possible with tools like natural language processing, computer vision, machine learning to make that as seamless as possible. And then also that fraudulent claims investigation with depending on what insurance area you're in, five to 10% of claims are fraudulent. So how do we better help the investigative teams that investigate those focus their investigations? And we'll touch upon both of these. Um, so if we look at the claims process, you generally have a first notification of loss. So you receive a claim. This can be via the phone, via your application, via a mail, whatever medium that is. And the first step is gonna be data extraction. Again, that data piece, what data is relevant in that claims information? Name, who, who the person is, the policy number, getting all of that data out. If it's a car accident, um, maybe taking, having it as simple as, and there's a lot of insurers that are doing this, but having the ability for the insurer to submit the claim via mobile app, take pictures of the damage, and then have a machine analyze, okay, based on the damage that we see, we have 10,000 other images of car accidents and the payouts that we've had to do for those over the past 10 years. What makes sense? What is the proper price that we should be paying out? And it could be that that whole process gets automated into a matter of seconds. We talked about analyzing a bit now already, but depending on what type of claim we're doing, running some machine learning, deep learning, against the, those data sets that you've extracted from that initial claim that you received, comparing that with the claims data history that you have, potentially cross-checking that. I mean, if someone submits a claim saying, yeah, it was uh, cold and icy and we got in a car accident, quickly cross-check that with external data sources, maybe weather data to say, ah, yeah, it was minus five degrees out and it was snowy that it's a reasonable claim. These are, again, just little checks to make sure the validity of the claim falls in line with what the, yeah, what the customer is saying. Processing that claim. I mentioned estimating that payout for, um, for a car accident. Those pictures alone, insurance companies, certain ones have the ability to prop from receiving that claim and receiving those pictures, all they do is they can instantly analyze, okay, the damage on that, we have 5,000 cases, it's about $2,000, uh, 2,000 francs. Um, here are three auto shops in the neighborhood that we recommend before that have had positive customer reviews. Making this process as simple as possible. Again, all of these stages generated data. You extract the data from the initial claim, you analyze that data against your existing database against external databases. Now reporting that in a way that feeds your own data banks, that feeds your own data processes. So this one example 
is then used when that next claim comes in and learning from that. Um, that's natural language generation. So having that text automatically be generated into the different yeah, data, so data storage areas that you need and then initiating that payout. And for certain insurance um, industries in certain countries, this process has been brought down to less than a minute for certain types of claims. So the bar is pretty high and um, there's still cases, m medical claims, um, larger yeah, property and casualty claims where this can often take uh, months and uh, almost sometimes years. I mentioned the, the fraudulent claims and the five to 10% of claims being fraudulent. Um, on the left side is generally how that's being approached today. It's a classic approach, a rules-based approach. There are a set of rules that fault that the system follows to say, ah, we think we have a suspicious claim. And then investigators are there to look into the susp suspicious claims and see what can they find. And then they'll generally find some of the fraud, but, but not all of it. And uh, it's a very labor intensive process and um, it still results in a lot, of, um, a lot of fraud being missed. On the right side, you still have the same amount of claims um, and it's still not 100% perfect. So you can still see that there is some fraud um, going through, but the suspicious claims is much smaller because that machine learning, that deep learning algorithm is basing it off of, again, hundreds or thousands of data points, really giving you a more granular insight as to these could be fraudulent claims. And then the investigators have a more focused area to be looking and are far more likely to catch some of those fraudulent cases. But if we look at that a little bit more closely, I mean, how does a system like this actually look? So we take all of the claims that are submitted and we provide anomaly scores. So what is the likelihood of fraud of a specific claim? And this is, yeah, this is again, hundreds of data points of that claim. How is the claim written? There's some insurance companies that look at how a person, if they're submitted via a mobile phone, how quickly was it typed up? And these are all micro data points that, that a human can't analyze but machines can process them and machine learning and deep learning algorithms can process these as key data points, or in this case, features to analyze and to make decisions against. So we're ranking those, um, those claims by which ones are most likely, and then we're setting that threshold. So we want to analyze everything that has 90% or 80% likelihood of being fraudulent. We can list all those claims up. And the important feature here, this top part is, yeah, it, it is machine learning. It is um, potentially deep learning, but this explanation model is really the key differentiator. Um, and a lot of people fear these artificial, uh, fear artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning because they consider it this black box. So it's really important that when you do develop one of these models, that you have an explanation engine, an interpretability engine to say, hey, we flagged claim one, two, three as fraudulent because of these are the reasons that, we, that the system flagged it. And that will really help investigators then say, okay, yes, no, oh, this seems to have been maybe an input mistake by, by the customer. Maybe he he simply made a mistake, so it allows them to much quicker yeah, mediate and remediate those types of fraudulent claims and catch the ones that are truly fraudulent. Underwriting, the heart of the insurance business. And like I said earlier, founded on statistics and now it's data science, now it's machine learning. 10 years ago, this was considered advanced statistics. And to a certain extent, we're using mathematical models, we're using more advanced models, but the foundations and the ideas are still the same. So in pricing and underwriting, we're seeing that trend towards far more dynamic risk and pricing models. We, want, we don't want um, one model to fit for 
yeah, a range of 10,000 people. We want every person, yeah, the goal is for each person to have that customized underwriting, that customized pricing. Um, if a property um, has these features, as of right now, it's fill in these 40, 40 boxes, define it, and that's it. Based on those 40 roughly inputs, the pricing and the underwriting is done. It's a very static and very, yeah, it's not a very dynamic approach. So evolving that. You mentioned the geospatial data. So using technologies like computer vision, like machine learning, to benefit from this completely new data source um, can really impact yeah, how underwriters are acting in the property and casualty space. And then looking overall at a portfolio, so you're tr by with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, you're able to yeah far better understand that overall risk of a portfolio. Um, are you over insure or are you insuring only maybe there's examples where there's islands and um, for a property and casualty insurer, they had only insured the northern part of that island. When a hurricane came and hit the northern part of that island, they were completely, they had a 100% payout. That southern part of the island, which wasn't hit, they realized they weren't actually insuring everyone, anyone there. They had only insured people on the northern half. So more deeply understanding that portfolio risk, that's obviously a property and casualty example, but for health or for automobiles, what types of cars and what regions, what types of drivers am I insuring for health insurance? What are the ages? What are the distributions of what I'm insuring? Understanding that overall portfolio risk can really help customers mitigate, um, yeah, mitigate those larger claims um, or the cost of those claims anyway. Um, here, let's take a closer look um, a bit at uh, geospatial data. So again, geospatial data, we're using satellite imagery to, yeah, to get a more granular look at what's being insured from a property perspective. Um, this is the completely new data source that most of the time, or five, 10 years ago, insurers weren't using. But for underwriters, this can be such a critical aspect because it allows them to get a far more granular view into what, what's actually being insured. A system can automatically say, okay, that's a three-story building. It has a flat roof. The roof has been um, renovated. It hasn't been renovated. These are all things that you can see with these satellite images. You can identify, okay, it is, or you can't maybe identify this from the geospatial data, but complementing this with, again, external data sources. So it's a home, it's within five minutes from a police station. It's within 10 minutes from a fire department. All of these data points, can be used to ensure that property and to give it that accurate pricing. A property that is two minutes closer to a fire department, maybe that, that has different risk aspects that need to be considered. And underwriters are now have access to far more than just the 40, 50 data points that a traditional person filled out when submitting their insurance or when an insurer went around looking at a house saying, ah, oh, the roof is not looking good, the windows could use work. Some of those things are now being handled with drones because they're far more dynamic and scale far better. But in the end, you're able to get a far deeper reading and yeah, calculate that risk exposure in a far better way to, in the end, offer better pricing for the customer. And I know that we talked about the claims topic earlier, but this top example, this could be a unique way for a customer might maybe was using this initially for, um, or an insurer was using this initially for the underwriting aspect, but now they can say, okay, we've had some flooding. How many of our customers are in this flooded area? We can now proactively reach out to them and say, hey, we think you're in a flood area. We've already filled out that claim submission form, maybe not 100% of the way, but 95% of the way. You're engaging that customer at a perfect time and helping them with a process where, oh, they have to go fill out a whole claims form now. 
and they're dealing with a flood in their home, it's again that customer experience where we've taken data that was maybe initially planned for the underwriting teams, but that that sharing of data and that making it more of a data-driven organization is now being used by the claims teams, by the sales and marketing teams to proactively engage these customers. And maybe it's an opportunity to reach out to these customers and say, hey, how about looking at flood insurance? This could be relevant for you. And especially now with the shifts in climate change, in global warming, you're seeing a lot of areas, whether it's wildfires, whether it's um, yeah, ocean levels rising, where the risk levels of different areas are changing far more quickly than they had historically. And um, geospatial data and drones data is really having an effect there in, um, in helping yeah, better underwrite as well, better resolve claims and overall increase that customer satisfaction. So that, um, the, those are the examples that I, that I wanted to touch upon. Now I want to go a bit into our, yeah, the best practices that we've learned at Unit 8. And um, one of the big ones that I like is dream big, start small. So with all of these initiatives, uh, if you say, ah, we need to become a data-driven company or we need to become an AI-driven company, whatever it might be, that's great. And that can be a vision, um, a five-year vision. But start small. Find actual problems, whether it's we want a fraud detection or we want a better fraud detection engine for our claims. We want that explainability model to help our investigators increase their um, focus by 20%. They should be small and realistic targets that you go after. And um, over the past couple of years, since we've been doing this, we've seen a lot of the common challenges. And one of the biggest is data quality. Um, I hope that you guys understood that every one of the examples that I gave is the aggregation, the coming together of several different data sources and several different data sources that traditionally it might have been relatively siloed. So it's bringing that together and bringing it together in a way that allows the data science, the data engineering teams to actually work with that data. Inflated expectations. Um, artificial intelligence is not the, yeah, it, it, it's, it's not the solution that's gonna revolutionize your, your company or or make you competitive for the next 20 years. It is a tool. It is one tool that it's a very powerful tool and it opens up a lot of possibilities, but it's just one tool. And setting those expectations clearly, especially for top management, so they understand, okay, we're going down this road. We expect relatively clearly these are the expectations, making sure that it is clearly defined um, so everyone has the same understanding of what we're expecting. Talent acquisition um, and retention. So data scientists and data engineers are in high demand. Um, you've got those digital native companies like, like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon acquiring a lot of them. And it's leaving a lot of the more traditional industries having difficulties in finding the talent. And when they do get the right talent, they have trouble retaining the talent because a lot of those the working environment that these data scientists and data engineers are looking for often don't fit into the traditional working environments that, yeah, that an insurance industry has provided. Which brings us to the fourth point, culture. And this, I think, is the most important aspect in any type of, whether we're talking about data science, machine learning, and AI, or any type of innovation, culture is gonna be the def defining factor. Does the senior management believe in what we're doing? Do the employees understand? Are they involved in the decision-making processes? And that's a really important point because you can build the greatest AI model in the world, but if it's not being adopted and not being used by the employees, then it's not a success. So when you're looking for that AI project, or let's call it a data science or an analytics project. Um, 
think about what AI can do and or think about what analytics can do. And there's lots of possibilities out there. What are your key initiatives as a company? What are you trying to do? And then what's the business impact? Because if it doesn't help your business, it's probably not the right thing to focus on. So it's really important that you're really focusing on what's feasible and what's valuable to your business. What's going to have an impact? What are your stakeholders going to say? Yeah, we're going to invest 100,000 francs into this, but we expect, what is that return? If the return is 50,000, it's not valuable. It's It just doesn't make sense. So, yeah. And sometimes I wonder if, yeah, why you need to reiterate that, but that isn't a really important point. Some people want to do AI for the sake of doing AI, and that isn't the right approach. Find a business problem, find something that you want to solve that's an initiative, and see if AI is the right technology for it. Maybe you're in this space and you need uh, robotic process automation, whatever it might be, making sure that you have that right topic and that you're addressing it with the right solution. So um, in regards to lessons learned, um, especially when you're starting off, you, you want those quick wins. You want to build credibility of the technology. Um, so you generally, the first project that you're starting off with shouldn't be, we want to revolutionize our customer experience um, across 50 different um, steps. Let's start with one step. Find one step, find one area that you can have a measurable impact on. And that measurable piece, that quantitative impact is really important because that's what's going to buy you credibility with the senior stakeholders. And once you implement that first project, and once you implement that second project, you'll have that stable base and you'll have built that trust in, ah, yes, data science, data analytics is a technology that we've used here and here, and it's resulted in these projects and they've been successful. And the more of those small projects you have, the more you can build on them. And those small projects, they generally start off as pilots. They start off as proof of concepts. And they will, these proof of concepts, they allow you to relatively quickly, relatively easily prove to, again, your stakeholders, what types of value you're talking about. How does this model, how is it gonna look? Starting small and proving that in that proof of concept environment will be really important so you don't waste time and resources scaling that into the full scale when it might not be actually the, yeah, achieving the results that you're looking for. We touched upon this, I mean, creating value, solving that real problem. Don't focus on things that, that don't have impact. Make the subject matter experts work together. Um, this isn't a project that the innovation department can lead on their own. This isn't the project that, that Unit 8 could lead on their own. This isn't a project that your IT can lead on their own. The business stakeholders, the IT stakeholders, data science, data engineering teams, they need to come together. The expectations of these three and the alignment needs to be there from the very beginning because other, otherwise it's just not going to work. You need that that acceptance, you need the business stakeholders to understand what's being done, you need the IT to understand what platforms and tools are needed, and then, yeah, ideally you have a, either internal data sources, you have colleagues like Unit 8, partners like Unit 8 helping you, um, and those three coming together will form the base for um, any of those projects. Being pragmatic. Um, A good machine learning model that runs in production is better than a perfect model that can't be deployed. What that means is even if your model might not be 100% ready, move it into that proof of concept, move it into that production stage. Start getting feedback from the users. And the most important thing is when you get that feedback, reiterate, this isn't like a project where uh, we installed um, Windows, we'll come back in five years and upgrade to Windows, whatever the next Windows is going to be. This is an iterative process. So if you build a model and two weeks later you get these five feedbacks from, you, from your users, 
start building that in. It's an iterative approach. Um, you're working far more agile with these, yeah, with these agile methodologies to really become more data driven. What data sources come in? How do we develop the model? How do we ensure that the model that we built today is still performing at the same level that it, it uh, in six months? All of these things need to come in and it's that agile approach that will help you. And again, the communication piece. So the change management piece, the communication, communicating with all the employees on what you're doing, why you're doing it, getting their feedback, getting their input, especially the ones that are going to be impacted by these technologies. Um, if you're working on a, on a chat bot um, for customer service, don't develop that for, for six months or 12 months in the IT department and then go and say, here's your new tool, customer service agent, start using it. Involve them from the beginning. They're going to have some of the best insights into all of their experiences having done customer engagement. So it's really important that you're communicating and that that change management topic is handled, um, handled appropriately. If we look at the data journey um, or the AI journey, analytics journey, whatever you want to call it, we break it down into four stages. There's um, strategizing and uh, ideation, which is coming up with these use cases. Again, relevant use cases, impactful use cases, re realistic use cases, moving those into proof of concept and prototype stages. And then the successful ones of those, scaling and industrializing those, making sure that the IT platforms, the cloud platforms, the data platforms, scale to move something from prototype into industrialization, it's actually a pretty big step. And making sure that that goes correctly is, um, is a big part. And then once you get to stage four, you're really operating those, those infrastructure platforms. You're using machine learning operations to, again, account for changes, extra data sources, AI ops, and the whole data governance piece. And once you're at stage four, it doesn't mean that you're done then you're actually probably going to go back to stage one and stage two to, again, come up with new ideas, come up with new ways, understand what new data sources there are and what new initiatives you can drive. And if none of those use cases are relevant or you say, well, those are all great, but what else does this journey give me? By doing all of these things, by aggregating those data sources, you're becoming a data-driven company. You're able to make smarter decisions based on the data at hand. You've got cleaner data structures, so everyone is working with the same data. The CFO and the finance department, when they say the numbers are this, other teams aren't going, well, we have different numbers. You're working with the same data, and that's key across an organization. And you just get far deeper business insights into internal processes, into external activities. Whatever you're doing, there's so many additional benefits to starting an AI or data practice um, throughout the company. And um, yeah, that's it for, for today. I hope that you generally found that interesting. Um, if you have any questions, I haven't been able to see the chat panel at all. I hope that some questions were coming in. Um, otherwise, feel free to ask them now and uh, yeah, we'll try to address them. Uh, perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Fabian, for for hosting the webinar. I'll, I'll let you take a, take a sip of water. Uh, we did have a few questions uh, actually related to the fraud detection uh, part that uh, fraud detection example that you covered. Um, mm -hmm. There were some, I guess, technical questions related to um, related to those um, graphs that you've been showing and yeah. the. What is it exactly that was uh, that was shown on those pictures? Meaning, were those uh, claims, transactions? Yeah, exactly in here. Yeah. So these um, these are transactions actually. Um, so this is for um, yeah. They, 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 this is more for a finance customer um, where we took financial transactions to detect fraudulent trades. Um, but the approach is the same. Um, for claims, you're reading out those, the different data points that make a claim fraudulent, and those aren't, th th those can be relatively granular, like I was saying before, how a claim is submitted, what type of writing is used in the claim, what time, hundreds of data points 
which are collected and then ranking those across um, all of the claims being submitted, taking out the most likely to be fraudulent claims. And then again, like I mentioned, that explanation engine. So why was this claim, in this case, why was this financial transaction listed as fraudulent? What are the reasons? And those reasons are given in, again, uh, an, uh, yeah, human understanding way. So the investigators that are reading that can say, ah, okay, because of the time that this was submitted and the cost and whatever else it might be, this is fraudulent. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll just add the comment that that uh, explanation engine that uh, Fabian is showing in here, those are so-called uh, sharp values to, to actually help understand uh, why, I mean, which which features uh, were taken into account or, or pulled, let's say, the, the decision-making one way or another. It, Fabian, we, we ran slightly out of time, so I'm going to uh, to start wrapping up the this webinar. Uh, to our audience, uh, thanks a lot for, for the questions I did uh, post in the chat window, how you can uh, interact with us after the session. Uh, like I've mentioned, we will be sharing the recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel. You can find over there also all the past recordings. And we do invite you for the next webinar uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, this one is going to be as part of our technology track, and it's going to be about MLOps. Uh, Fabian, thanks a lot once again for taking us through the uh, AI in insurance, and I'm wishing everyone a really good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot.